review. I've never really understood the appeal of the whole unboxing thing on YouTube. Is it all about the suspense? Finding out if the item is the item that's in the title of the video? Or is it about the excitement, having waited for a new product for a very, very long time, and dying to see it, you delay the actual viewing by a couple more minutes watching it being unboxed? Or is it just for those stupid people who don't know how to open a box without mauling it apart like some kind of hungry inquisitive bear and destroying the contents therein? Either way, the new Graham Farish C-Class comes in wraparound plastic packaging, similar to the style used by Backman in most of their 00 products. This to some could be a regression, seen as Farish has used it before, but I believe it's perfectly adequate. Also, it's not too complicated for those who are likely to turn into a bear whilst trying to open up their new products. Anyway, without much further ado, here is the unboxing, and I've decided to play on the excitement side of things. See you on the other side. So now you've seen how it unboxes, and you've also seen the instructions and the warranty which are all included. Now to see the model itself, and I must say, it is an absolute beauty. I make no apologies for overplaying that bit. After all, this is one of the prettiest locomotives ever made in British end scale. Farish have released three versions of it. British Railways Black, Southern 1940s Black with Sunshine Lettering, and the Southeastern and Chatham Railway Simplified Green. However, the Southeastern and Chatham Railway version has raised questions. After researching the prototype in numerous books, I have not managed to find a single photograph that this exact livery existed. All the Southeastern and Chatham photographs being of the original iconic livery or the grey livery with white lettering. However, a passage in D.L. Bradley's The Locomotive History of the Southeastern and Chatham Railway is the only evidence I could find of this livery existing. The use of such an elaborate livery for goods engines evoked some criticism and, at the board meeting on the 26th of July 1910, a group of directors persuaded the chairman to instruct Wainwright to investigate what savings were possible by substituting black for all goods and tank classes. 
Wainwright reported on the 30th of November 1910 that replacing the Brunswick green with a lined black livery would offer no worthwhile savings since the main expense was labour and the basic materials. He did, however, suggest that the dome covers of goods engines should be painted over and the lining simplified. After inspecting C-Class number 508 in the modified livery, the directors accepted Wainwright's recommendation. This simplified version of the livery would have cascaded into traffic from 1911 onwards until the unlined green was adopted in 1914. However, being the closest option to the iconic livery made famous by the only preserved example, number 592, this is bound to be a popular choice. 592 being famous, of course, for its numerous film appearances, including the 1996 film The Wind in the Willows. The model itself is DCC ready with a Next 18 Dakota socket. This arrangement was used on Farish's last steam model, the Castle. On that one, you just literally pull the tender body off with a click and then you could take out the blanking plate and put the chip in before replacing the tender body. On this engine, however, it's a bit more complicated. I feel this is an area where they have regressed. I found I had to take a screwdriver and wedge it in between the coal load and the wall of the tender in order to prise the coal load out. In the instructions it says to take the coal load out, and the tender body is indeed moulded to the tender chassis, so you cannot remove it. The only access to the plug is through the coal load. Once inside, it is fairly simple. You just put a small screwdriver under the blanking plate and flick it up. Then you can push your chip into place. The model has also got a speaker fitted ready for sound, so changing it to a sound fitted version is just as simple provided you get the correct chip. Once fitted, you just push the coal load back into its place and then off to the programming track and then onto the layout. Once on the layout, it was straight into the storage yard and coupled up to a goods train I prepared for this review. I saw that as the most appropriate consist for it, being a goods engine after all, even though Farish have repeatedly advertised it with birdcage passenger stock. This is not inappropriate by any means, but it was by no means common. These engines were primarily goods engines, and passenger working was only really on specials or when there was a shortage of other motive power. Once out on the layout it was found to be a very quiet and smooth runner from the beginning. It is driven from a coreless motor to the trailing axle of the locomotive. However, this is slightly slack to the other two axles, so you can see the rod is sort of wandering up and down a bit with the continuing motion of the train. I wonder if this goes away when the engine is under less load. The train it's pulling consists of 15 wagons and a brake van. Fifteen wagons should be an average load for it to manage up the gradient. The climb it's approaching is an average of one in sixty-five out of a fourth radius curve. The plan was to drive it up the gradient till the entire train was on the slope, then stop, then see how well it picks up the load when restarting. Now it's got the road and can head onto the single line. You see it now heading through the junction and onto the fourth radius U-curve to head back up towards the camera. So now once on the climb you can see it's starting to struggle a bit, but we've yet to stop it and see if it'll restart. Now stationary, we've tried to restart the train. No movement at all other than wheel slip. Would bunching the couplings together and trying to pull get away with it? With a lot of slipping, it managed to restart the train after bunching the couplings. We took two wagons out of the consist, reducing it to 13 in the brake van. Now still slipping, the train manages to start off without reversing and bunching.
With the reduced train of 13 wagons, the C-Class manages to get towards the top of the climb and over the summit. Graham Farage advertised it running with passenger coaches and these are the birdcage stock. Now that the engine is under much less load you can see that the connecting rods are not wandering about like they were before when the engine was under load. So to sum up, I think Graham Farish have come on to a winner with this one. It's a very well liked prototype and it's a, certainly a very pretty locomotive. In summary, it is the most ready to run locomotive I've ever come across. The only fittings that come in the box are coupling hooks and doors for the footplate. That is it. Out of the box it's pretty much complete and fitting a DCC chip, well that took under a minute as you saw. The only thing I would say is that those wandering rods do look a bit odd. Perhaps they could have used fixed ones just to make it look more realistic. Also, the addition of traction tyres would have helped a lot with haulage. 13 is a little bit pitiful for an engine which was claimed to be able to pull 600 tonnes. Having said those negative things, I should make it obvious. It is a fantastic model. I don't regret buying it one bit. It looks stunning. It runs really well. It has all the normal features you'd expect from a modern Farish locomotive to make it exemplary. You have to nitpick to find faults. If you want to buy one, they're available from Sawyer Models, where I got this one from. The Southeastern and Chatham version being priced at £127.95 and the other two versions at £114.71. I shall leave a link in the description.